You're watching the Fayetteville Government Channel. Up next, full coverage of the latest meeting of the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board. The Parks and Recreation Advisory Board is composed of citizen volunteers and meets on the first Monday of each month. The board advises the city council and city staff on issues that affect the city's parks and recreational programs. And now, the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Well, welcome everybody to the uh, November 4th, 2013 meeting of the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board. Uh, we'll get started this evening on the agenda, which looks like a fairly short agenda. Uh, we need to go ahead and take a look and approve the October 7th uh, meeting minutes. Since I was not here, I don't have any changes or additions. Any changes, additions, deletions? From anyone? Motion to approve the min minutes as is. Sir. I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes from October 7th. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. Good. Okay. Let's move on. Uh, looks like the second topic tonight is regional park update. Allison, I assume that you are, since you're driving, going to do that. Who's doing the regional park update? Oh. Uh, yes. Uh, well, as you know, early voting starts November 12th electric election. Um, so early voting starts tomorrow. Tomorrow. And then next Tuesday next is Tuesday the is election. Election, election. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. Oh, Lowson Associates. We have a contract on consent agenda tomorrow night for the design uh, of the final master plan and the preliminary grading and drainage report for the entire 200 acres. So that'll be on tomorrow night for approval. And as soon as they, as soon as council approves that, then we'll get going um, with Lowson Associates. All right. Super. And as you all know, we're at going on we had 4.5 million dollars that would do the six lit soccer fields concession stand the entry road utilities um, great lawn and parking lots and then if the bond is approved then it adds in at least three lit baseball fields parking lot a large pavilion and a large playground on the great lawn so y'all, it's coming. Awesome. And I might just state, Lowson and Associates is, I think, uh, we had a select selection committee that looked at them. We had 11 different uh, firms that applied. Uh, Lowson and Associates are the ones that had done our original master plan that actually recommended that, uh, along with our citizens, that we needed a regional park. So, and that's all that they do every day is park projects you know they do master plan of parks and designing the park parks every day so I, I think we've got a great team lined up uh, they teamed up with a local uh, company Garber engineers so I, I'm really expecting good stuff so we just need to get it approved tomorrow great. good news definitely a while in the making yes That's for sure. <clears throat> okay uh, that's regional park update. Next, we have uh, USTA tennis program request. Um, Chris Cash and Andrew Atkinson and Erica Rogers. Come on up, guys. If you just um, state your name and tell everybody who you are, and we'll get started with your presentation. Oh, you can stand right here, but wherever you like. Uh, I'm Andrew Atkinson, and this is Erica Rogers. Our head pro, Chris Cash, is currently in Denver at a U.S. Tennis Association event. So we're going to talk to you tonight about our plans for uh, tennis in Fayetteville. All right, so we have a three-phase plan for you guys. I think you'll have some sheets passed around. So the first phase, we want to start soon in November, but really starting in December. And we want to use the public courts in Fayetteville, mainly Walker Park and Wilson Park, to start off. And we want to use them for some basic adult programming, some basic um, youth programming. We also want to do some cardio classes for all ages um, and also start routes for our Fayetteville tennis program. And so then in February, once we get everything going, we want to start some USTA adult leagues 
and some team drills. And we also want to expand our youth programming and have a court reservation, court reservation system going and hopefully have a website to help us um, better expand our clients and also help people reserve courts better and be able to use our public courts better because we feel like they could be used a lot more than they are. And then in phase three in April, we want to have um, our USDA junior team tennis program going. We want to have team tennis drills open. We want to further expand our youth programming and we want to be able to look back at what we've done so far and see if there's anything else we need to add or expand or how we can make it better. And then uh, we have some benefits on the last page and mainly talking about how we really feel like our program could help us reach more people and reach a lot of people that don't have access to clubs. You know, a lot of people who play tennis are members of private clubs and we feel like we can use our public courts more and really get kids and adults playing on these public courts and get them interested in tennis and get them to play tennis <coughs> and be part of our leagues. We also think we could help the patrons really um, be able to access our courts and if we have someone organizing them and looking over them we can really help people get on those courts and play and have an opportunity to play more. So that's what we have been thinking about. Do you have any questions for us? Or? And I just like to throw in that we, we met with the Northwest Arkansas tennis rep as well as the state tennis rep and um, it was just it came highly recommended since we have no real reservation system for the courts we have no real programming in general um, so there's just kind of across the board benefits to implementing some kind of program. Also, 10% of whatever we make is going to come back to Parks and Rec. What time? What yeah. times are these classes? Are so the we're going to be totally flexible since we're starting now, but there's a little breakdown. Um, we'll be at Wilson and Walker. Uh, it's number two on the second page. Uh -huh. uh, different days of the week will alternate um, Wilson and Walker uh, throughout the week and then Saturday. I believe both places on Saturday. Um, but the policy uh, starting out will be never use more than two courts at a time so as to not take up you know, all the courts at, at any one given time. So what about cardio tennis offered seven times a week? Uh, I think that would normally be a little bit later, but we're flexible on times. And that would just be something that you can pay for by the month or per session. And it's just available each day. And you can just drop in and play and just any age get people moving and hit tennis balls. So yeah, I don't think that's going to be any, uh, I think that'll alternate with the schedule, be a Wilson one right. day, Walker the next. Okay. We're very excited for, for the classes to be at Walker, too. We've never had uh, tennis lessons at Walker. And they're nice courts. They are great courts. The lights are very good. How, how do we know, how does somebody know how to get, how to get plugged into this program? We're gonna we're gonna incorporate signage at the courts, and then we're also gonna promote it on our website and use our online uh, sign-up software for people to register and gain information. We'll put out some press releases. Yeah, press releases. We'll use social media to promote it. Um, but I think signage at the court will be a big part because people that play obviously show up there. And then once word spreads that there is a program, they can go on our website, get the details. Uh, register for the program and then eventually get a reserve courts through there as well. Do we have a reservation system right now? We do for ball fields, we just don't for courts. But, but not for tennis courts. Right. So really this is... Well people can't, okay, you can do an event form if you have a special event and reserve them that way, but just for um, hourly time slots or um, just smaller, smaller deals now. We used to have a blackboard uh, years and years ago. And, have, you know, and that probably quit in the early 1990s. So since then, we haven't had any. Could, could I, would it be a fair comparison to equate this to our, our baseball program, where we have, we kind of have a group that's, that's running that and helping us schedule that and utilize the courts? Um, kind of a similar thing for tennis? In a way, but it'll be there. Always will be some tennis courts open for the public, so it's not as though you have to have it reserved. There's still be time that they'll be able to have pickup games. Okay. So, and that's important to us. Mm -hmm. Will the local tennis clubs be able to have like a standing reservation of any kind, or would they be expected to reserve on a regular basis? Sorry, local tennis clubs like. Athletic club or something? Well, it's 
mentioned in here that there there was like ten, the only way to get involved with tennis clubs. Is that to, are we referring to? Well, like Bay Bluff Athletic Club, Club oh, okay. has like their own league, and you have to pay fees to go there. Gotcha. Or summer hill or any other. Right. Yeah. yeah, I think it's just suggesting it's more open. Gotcha. Anyone won't be charging, you know, high membership fees, so anyone can be able to afford it. And we'll even look at the same, uh, hopefully get with Pagnozzi about possible scholarships for youth that need the assistance. So 10% of that revenue comes to Parks and Rec budget. Yes. And what happens to the other 90%? That's going to pay for our coaching fees, and uh, we want to get some equipment and uh, make sure that the courts are always kept up. And Okay. So is that ten percent? Is that similar to what like you mentioned the baseball club? Is yeah, that kind of so is that a similar structure well, that we have with, with other groups? The baseball club that they do it per player fee. Okay. But this one since we don't know how many players we're doing just the flat ten percent, which has been a partnership that we've done with other programs, especially starting a new ten percent is what we do with like our concession. Uh, contracts, other things like that, that we do just contract out, generally we just get in 10%. Mm -hmm. And it's comparable to baseball, but with baseball there's obviously extensive maintenance involved, so that's why it's not just 10% flat. Has the uh, has the pressure on our courts gone down since since February opened their new practice facility? You know, we had, a, we had a big round last year with folks that wanted to use the Wilson Park tennis courts and could not because Fayetteville High was using them for practice. Right. Has that changed any since last I, year? Do I you have know? not had. I have not heard of anybody complaining. No, if you have, we have not received any email or I guess phone calls in our office about not being available. So we try to monitor. I mean, I, I don't. I rarely see the courts completely full. And on the same note, I never get any complaints as to not being able to access courts. Well, I know. I mean, we had Chase last year. You know, monitor everything, and we found that it was. We didn't see an issue um, with availability. I just wondered if, uh, if that had really lightened up since Federal High has moved to their facility. We've, we've kept routinely, we'll call in and, and Melanie keeps a chart mm -hmm. on how many people are at the tennis courts at this time when staff dri drives by. So we have kept some numbers, but I, I know every time I've done it, I don't think that there's been totally filled unless we had an event. I'm not sure if the public has access to the Fayetteville School Courts. They do not. And that's what I thought. We were yeah. told that there was going yeah, to be a program, but mm -hmm. evidently they haven't launched it yet or and decided I, not I mean, to. I play at Wilson Park and I hit there with you know someone regularly and I've never had to wait more than 10 or 15 minutes to get on court. It's never been extremely crowded. Okay. And I see that park staff is uh, recommending approval of the request. Yes. So you guys are supporting, do you think we we can work through all the startup Yeah, issues? the fact that it is new, I think any kind of potential problems if we're on the courts at a peak time, we need to adjust. It's, Chris has assured us uh, that the coaches and staff are completely flexible to adjusting it however we need to. Okay. Before we approve this, i got just one quick question about the phases here. Is, is winter tennis pretty typical? A lot of people play during the winter. I played on public courts growing up since I was four in Little Rock, and we normally have the, it's above 40 degrees, we're out there playing, bundle up, so I, we played both, we both played through the winter, I mean, more kids are going to come this spring, but we definitely have a bunch of kids wanting to come play for us now. So. And it might actually be beneficial to try to start when, the, when it's not going to be as big of a rush, so that mm -hmm. everybody can kind of get their feet underneath them. I mean, I was just, I'm kind of looking and we're assessing the state of the, well, I guess it says federal tennis. Where are we assessing the state of this program? In April. In That's April? So, April 1st, I mean, there's no guarantee that everybody wants to get out and play tennis before April 1st, but then everybody might want to get out and play tennis. Is that, is the timeline maybe a little bit? Um, it's well, just our plan. It's not anything set in stone, it's just what we would like to be at. Also, in April is when um, team tennis really kicks up, so it's like this nationwide push to kind of get back out there and 
you know, sign up for your teams and stuff. So I think, I think we'll have a good idea, and we can always assess further down the road. We just want to make sure that early, if there's a problem or anything we need to adjust, that we can. I think it'll be a continual yeah. assessment throughout. But we're not going to abandon this in April if it hasn't been yeah, no, a no, response, no. right? I think okay. that was more general. Just take a okay. look back in phase three and see where we are, but I think it's going to be something we're monitoring closely okay. the whole way. I just want to make sure we weren't abandoning a program because we it didn't work over right. the winter time. Right. Um, I do think, though, that there ought to be some type of a year-to-year -year sure. kind of assessment that goes along with it, so that if it doesn't work out for you or it doesn't work out for the citizens or city or whoever, that we have the ability to listen forever, that, you know, that it could be adjusted or changed. Or and that's how we handle whatever. most, I think, every outside activity group do a, an annual review contract and uh, it's up for renewal each year, so we'll treat it the same way. And we can have them do survey monkey, the participants, see how well we are surveyed. That's a good idea. We're excited. It's been a number of years since we have had a tennis instructor, you know, a formal tennis program. Mm -hmm. And I think it will help revitalize the sport. At Fayetteville, it really has not. Most of the people who play the team at tennis, they played elsewhere. They travel elsewhere to play. We've never had a real team at Wilson here in the city of Fayetteville. So hopefully by the time we'll get those tennis people coming and have a you know continue to have a need for it growing for the regional park is what I Okay. Any more discussion? We'll make a motion we accept the uh, tennis proposal so I can get enrolled in some of these cardio tennis classes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll second part of the motion. <laughs> So we have a motion and a second to uh, approve the park recommendation on USTA tennis program. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. Looks like you guys got some work to do. <laughs> Thank you. We're excited. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, guys. So, the county, does anything like this have to go to the city council? Does it just go on? No, because there's there's no fees involved. You got to raise the guidance for him. Yes. Great. I think that's a. I think that's a good idea. Sure. Okay, let's see. Uh, Lake Fayetteville Boat Dock Trail Revision, Matt Mahalovich. Hi, Hi, Matt. Thanks for having me. Matt Mahalovich, Trails Coordinator for the city of Fayetteville. Um, we have an exciting project coming up next year, a uh, very highly requested piece of Lake Fayetteville Trail. Here's a map of what we're proposing. Basically, we have the whole loop around the, the park, but there's a section of the trail where it's shared with the driveway, the road, uh, that goes to the North Shore Duke Disc Golf. It works okay, but as we're seeing the increase in usage out there, and actually this piece is actually part of the Razorback Greenway, so we really want to make it you know, nice and, and consistent with the rest of it where we don't have an on-street piece. So, uh, that's what we're proposing. Wanted to bring it in front of you guys just to information on more than anything. Um, it will involve some fence um, changing up around the marina because, as you know, if you've driven um, along the road that you go to North Shore, and we can probably zoom in right along here. Um, this yellow line, there's a, there's a fence that was right along the road there, and it's pretty overgrown and, and everything. Um, we'd like to put the trail just to the south of that fence and actually remove the fence and we're putting in a new one shown in red. A little ways away from the trail, we're looking at about a minimum of 15 feet away from the trail. It gives some buffer. We didn't want to make it feel like a tunnel or anything going through there. Uh, and then kind of clean up that fence line. There's a lot of scrubby stuff to keep all the nice trees uh, in that area. Um, and then also it would turn and, and tie in with the, the existing trail across the dam a little bit different connection there. Currently people are having to kind of cut through where the kiosk signs are. Um, we're having a lot of erosion issues there. So we would we'd go ahead and make that in more of a natural curve there uh, and cross here with the colored concrete. Um, moving the gates for the marina back just back a little bit. So nothing would really change too much with the marina area other than the fence just kind of moves in a little bit. Um, and we're proposing to use black vinyl coated chain link fence instead of what's there now which is one of the galvanized so it'll help blend in. Here's an example of the picture, kind of this overgrown uh, area along the road. That would be where the trail would be. Here's the picture of the fencing 
Uh, so we'd end up with a nicer fence there. The trail would be just on either side. We're keeping it up from the lake uh, to keep from being in the riparian corridor or the riparian area of the lake. So we still we still go close to this road, but enough away to give us the buffer. Uh, we are looking at using concrete for the trail surface as well. Um, that's consistent with the rest of the Razorback Greenway and 12 foot width to, to match everything. So. Uh, and also we got a grant to help pay for part of this is uh, through the recreational trails program through HCD, about $75,000. Awesome. Yeah, it's all good, I think. So. <laughs> it's definitely the only Great, great idea because I've walked on that and that street's dangerous. Is it just, uh -huh. it's, it's dangerous for everyone and also having the bikes and strollers and people walking through the parking lot there at the disc golf course, yeah. that, that gets we'll very busy. That so he's, he's, yeah, I don't think I showed that, but yeah. if you see on this one, we'll come on the other side oh, of the yeah. white fence and then hook right in where, where that sidewalk is. So it'll just be kind of a straight connection avoiding the parking lot. And we're starting on this? Uh, early next year, early 14. We've got to finish down at the Salagi, Chalagi Trail uh, first. Hey, can you home. mind giving us a quick update on Chalagi, sure. on yeah. Martin Luther, and on the Johnson Connection? Sure, yeah. Um, let's see, where should I start first? I mean, we go Johnson. south of north, north oh, of south. south. You can look <laughs> it up. Whatever. Uh, okay, I'll start with the tunnel. Uh, the MLK, the walls are finished with the retaining walls yeah. that are both sides of the ramp. And so they're going to be starting this week. The rain's kind of slowed down a little bit, but they'll be starting pouring back trail uh, down the ramp through the tunnel. We're getting the lights put in. Electricians are working on that. So Great. they're actually talking about opening the tunnel portion along MLK earlier than the rest of the trail. Um, because one holdup is going to be there's three bridges on it, and they're the steel bridges like we put on the rest of the trail yeah. system. They take a little while to manufacture, and uh, so they are being constructed. They're going to be delayed a little bit. That's, that's the portion on down to Walker? Uh huh. To Walker the, the Creek. Yeah, and actually there's a crossing just to the south of MLK um, to get to the Grove section right. there. So right. there's a bridge there, there's one by El Camino, and then there's one right in going into uh, Walker Park. So those three. But they're working down on 9th Street to mm -hmm. near Walker Park, kind of get, getting there. The bridge abutment piles are in, so they'll start working on building the concrete parts of the bridges. Uh, maybe put an electrical conduit. It's going really well. Also, you'll see the South School right for the El Camino. There'll be some work there. There's going to be a signal there that's mm -hmm. a new type of signal. A pedestrian hyper beacon or hawk signal is what it's called. Um, it's be kind of a new, and we'll put a crosswalk across there. Awesome. So, yeah, it's going to be exciting. And then that Chala Gee Trail is going to tie right in. Um, it's just south of MLK near Government Street, mm -hmm. and it'll fill up right in and then head west. Uh, it's under construction by our crew over by Chick-fil-A and the Arby's behind yeah. there. Along that called, road called Indian Trail. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's going pretty well. They have some curb and gutter and, and uh, storm drainage stuff that takes a little time. And then heads west through a tunnel through under the active rail line. Uh, and that's all in and almost finished. And then across a bridge that we, old trestle bridge that we put a new concrete deck on. And right. that's real cool. Awesome. So, and then just, it's going to be exciting to connect up all that student housing. Yeah, nice. that would be a good option for them mm -hmm. to get across the street too. Yeah, pretty much connecting up that whole that whole part. So that's great. Excited about that. Um, yeah. North, okay, North Clear Creek Trail. Mm -hmm. It's officially named. The council did approve your naming of it. Uh, for okay. Board recommendation of Clear Creek Trail and extending Skull Creek Trail up, up to that. So it, um, it's built all the way to 71B from Skull Creek Trail. Now it's it wow. paved. Now they're still dressing up handrails, things like that, right. so it's not open to the public yet. Right. Uh, but I got a little sneak peek right on it, <laughs> and it's very nice. Awesome. Very nice. Has the connection up to the mall. They're finishing that up by the J.C. Penney parking lot. Um, yeah, it's really gonna be cool. There's one spot where it crosses Clear Creek, and there's a really tall bridge, and then the trail actually cantilevers out, sort of over the creek for a section. It's just really it's a pretty Neat. spectacular little piece. Mm -hmm. So. No guardrail either. No guardrail yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be careful. I'll wait. You have to have the official in progress inspection. Yeah, okay. In progress inspection. <laughs> it's gonna have rail, right? Uh -huh. yeah, it's gonna have pictures. rail. It will have rail, yes. <laughs> I hope they're in the rail up. Because there are people that are 
Fresh oh, no, the mm -hmm. yeah. Apparently, right over here. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just saw the picture. I saw the picture. Oh, okay. That's right. I have put some pictures out. Hey, I, I have a question based on the email that we received. And I don't know if Connie answered this or not. I should know this because you send you update us every single time. When, when are trails, when do you have um, slated for trails to get to the regional park? Yeah, um, we've been working on some right away for the the main trail. I think that'll go to the regional park is the Cato Springs Trail. So that that ties in with Town Branch Trail, which is south of Walker Park. So mm -hmm. then it'll kind of head back west. Town Branch, we're about to bid a section by the Research Technology Park from South School to Great House Park. So if you're familiar, it's all south of 15th Street. Mm -hmm. From Great House Park, uh, it'll work away. That's where Cato Springs comes in the creek and it falls along that creek and on in. So, you know, I was kind of gauging the priority based on when the regional park's built. You know, but as soon as I think, once we get going on that, it'll be a high priority to get that trail connected in. Do you sure. have any idea on timeline? Um, um, no. I can't tell That's you okay. exactly. Um, it's dependent on the park, too. You don't want to build a trail to nothing? To nowhere. No. <laughs> <laughs> Roger just tried that. Huh? Yeah, not the bridge. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. I, th I think we had kind of the same comments when, when we moved the Boys and Girls Club mm -hmm. from the middle of Fayetteville out to the other side of the bypass, and, and that's worked out very well for us as a community. So yeah. I think, you know, once we get to the point where we actually have a park out there and we start connecting up, we'll, we'll be fine. And until then, we'll all continue to drive our cars to the soccer field like we just do at Lewis. So. And I think it's exciting once we get the Rupert Road goes on over the mountain, mm -hmm. and we get the Boys and Girls Club, Club tied into the original park, too. Mm -hmm. Then that would really be a great connection. Yeah. Do we have plans for a trail to go over the, over the mountain by, by Ozark Mountain Smokehouse? There, it's on the master plan. Um, you know, I have trouble visioning like a paved trail for that because it's a Kessler, you know, it's so natural. But if we could find a way, you know, I know there's the road already that mm -hmm. we can use. Um, there is the old Trent Trail that goes across there. That's sort of a road, road ish. So you know, it's possible if the yeah. public was supportive of it, and we could do it in a really sensitive way. If being your park, that's yeah, that's a little bit further away. Smokehouse will line up with Ruppel, yeah. mm -hmm. and Ruppel is going to have a 12-foot trail all the way along it from right. from MLK all the way up to Virginia, or well, all actually all the way up the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, so it is going to be a great connection there. But Assuming it's going to have a signal across the you know, MLK there, and, but then yeah, as you work your way up, you know, it's going to be very steep. But you know, I still think it would be great to make that connection. Sure, I've looked at different alignments and things. So. Okay, maybe go down by the water tanks and maybe down or something. Matt, you might tell them too that Clear Creek, the red dirt, is up to the south end of Lake Fayetteville Dam. Oh yeah, uh huh. They've uh, if you haven't been so out there, the base for uh huh. Mm -hmm. They're working their way up that hill and. Uh, if you're familiar with the large boulders that are down through there, <laughs> they've actually scooted them out aside, and so you can now the trail will go between them. So, so it's, it's what, pretty neat. How did that collector out there? Is that from when they built that levee? I think so. I don't know all the history, but I, we always kind of assumed that they've been there forever, yeah. ever since I moved here in '78. So, so I don't know if they grew there or what. <laughs> Kind of a feature of the way they make it. You kind of go down. I mean, somebody, it looks cross. like somebody put them. They yeah. Yeah, the yeah, they're not natural. Yeah. I mean, they, yeah, they're actually placed. One of them was 30,000 pounds, and they were able to get it. Great. <laughs> Somehow. And they, some places it chipped off, but they said they're going to work it and put moss on it and make it kind of look more natural. <laughs> so I'll try to blend it in. And then it's steep, but it, it's really, they've worked the grades, and we've been looking at the slope lot to try to make it as, as soft as possible on the slope and then actually it's going to have a little rest area too in it midway up because it's about 9 to 10 percent slopes is what it's looking like to come up from locomotion up to the spillway bridge. Um, so. We might need to have a walk lane. Yeah, yeah. I know. And I, I even was thinking if we had some extra the width there, it's right. so yeah. steep that there's just oh, walkers on lights. Yeah. yeah. We know we're going slow uphill. It's the downhill that you have to kind of worry about. Those bikes are shooting down the hill. But we did look at the intersection of where it ties in to like Fayetteville. I ran that by the contractor, and they're okay with that, changing that. So I thought you were going to patrol the speed around there. 
Yeah, I'll be out there with a little radar gun. <laughs> <laughs> Slow it down, 15 mile hour. <laughs> well, thanks, Matt. And yeah. good job on the border road as well. Okay, yeah. That's really yeah, nice. Yeah, it's a lot. To not have to get on the road there. It's Only excellent. bad news is they're going to be ready to close it for a little bit. <laughs> I know. <don't laughs> we just got it open. <laughs> I know. I've been, they have to do a little work to the box culvert because one of the new bridge piers for the new highway, it goes right through that box culvert that runs under there. So they have to close it a little further. But I'm trying to get it down to two weeks so. and then open back up. Well. Oh, well. Man. Thanks, man. Okay. Appreciate yeah, it. Thanks for all the support. Okay, let's see. Parkland Ordinance Amendment Proposal. Allison. Mm -hmm. um, we have a proposal for you guys tonight, and um, John has talked about it a little bit in the past, too, and we just felt like the timing was right to bring it forward. Um, right now, the ordinance applies to only certain types of developments, and those are PZDs, large-scale developments, uh, residential subdivisions, and then lot splits. And, oh, also large site improvement plans. And those are generally defined by developments that are an acre or larger. And so it excludes some of these smaller infill type projects that we've been seeing come through, um, especially in the downtown area, student housing or other residential housing. So we're proposing in the applicability section just to add small site improvement plans and duplexes. And that would cover every type of residential development that comes through planning. So it's a small change, but a big change, because we're seeing uh, you know, multi-level residential developments coming in, and we're not, and they're heavily impacting our park system, especially being right downtown, but we're not seeing any funding to go into repair facilities or upgrade existing facilities in our parks. So a little example would be if, if it's nine tenths of an acre that there's 150 some, 154 I think was the number of single uh, multi-family units that are going in, you know, they would have to pay around 85,000. So if there's 154 multi-unit going in on 1.1 acres, they would have to pay by the, I'm sorry, the nine tenths would of an acre would not have to. So we're just, we're trying to make equity in it amongst development, but more or less the impact on parks will be significant. Mm -hmm. So that way we can keep the parks up for those people. How would that work on a duplex? It would be, right now duplexes, we, depends on how they come through. If we see a large scale development that has. Um, well, we just had one, didn't we, on Dean Solomon or Mount Comfort Road mm -hmm. just last year, where they came duplexes. into a real small lot and put like four duplexes. Yep, and we assess those as individual single Comfort. family units if they're on separate lots. So sometimes you might have a duplex that is on one lot, and we would consider those multifamily. But if it's on, if it's, they can have attached wall, but if there's a lot line going down it, then we assess them as two single family. Well, when the, when the lot split is done, we would collect the fee then. Mm -hmm. But if somebody it, has a single lot sitting out there that they've already paid a fee on, as of right now, they could build a duplex and not have to pay an additional fee. Right. And this would put it, how, so, when they went to apply for their permit, they'd have to pay another one, just mm -hmm. for the one. Okay. Yeah. There any downsides to this? I mean, I mean, there's not downsides for us if we're getting more money for parks, but if, I, if I'm looking at it from a citizenry I, I standpoint. Think, I think the developers, we want to encourage infill, but I think from a developers, I think they would certainly understand, you know, that it is an impact on our parks, and and hopefully it's it's something that will benefit their constituents. Of, you know, what we would be doing to parks within their quadrant to improve them. So it makes our parks better for their clientele. And this money can only be used for development and acquisition. It doesn't go for maintenance, but it would allow us to be able to improve 
existing facilities and, or acquire other Well, I think it's going to have a big impact. I, I don't think the duplexes is an issue, but on the small site improvement plans, mm -hmm. you know, there's uh, a lot of challenges in that realm of development right now uh, already. And, you know, one of the things that I think is interesting in this town is that we try to develop in town and that keeps us from going out towards Weddington or White Rock or, you know, the other places, the other natural areas that we have. And I think for the purposes of this committee, you know, we do have to keep citizens in mind, you know, we are trying to bring in as much revenue as we can. But at the same time, we don't want to make it just impossible to, to build on a small site. Um, so I think, we'll, I think we'll get some feedback about that. I think so, too. Because, because correct me if I'm wrong here, my grandfather owns some land, and I go build a house on his land. I'm now paying an impact fee to parks. Not if it's just a single family house? Not if it's just a single family house. No. Basically what, anything what about, above a, a... What about like a basement apartment downtown? Like, like if I put in a basement apartment to have a college student live there? Mm -hmm. And you're going to say you had an existing house and then you add that? Extra we would never there. see you it. The extra, you know, doesn't, no, doesn't apply. No, no, does it? Does it <laughs> Yeah. So those well, are depends on if you get a permit or those not. Those are things that are issues <laughs> 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 uh, Those are things that are issued just by a, a single building permit, and we don't review really those. They wouldn't come before this board. Well, I, in my experiences, uh, I can tell you that you know there there are a lot of challenges developing on these small sites. You know, the the larger sites when you're over an acre, and you're you know putting in a, a large development, uh, you can absorb these type of costs and it's, and it's still feasible. And the smaller the site is, it becomes less and less feasible. And, uh, you know, I just, I think you can do, uh, I think you can do enough of this kind of stuff to make it completely impossible. And. Yes, we want to bring in as much revenue as we can because they are impacting. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know they are. Mm -hmm. um, that's, a, that's the reason people come to Fayetteville is because we have these type of developments in the town. So they want to live there. Many of them are going to be very close to all of these trails. Mm -hmm. And so we know there's an impact. But at the same time, I would, I would hate to support anything that, that, that uh, prevents us from doing the types of development that Fayetteville is somewhat uh, known for, and, and that's part of one of the things that makes our town attractive to people to come to that. Mm -hmm. Have we explored a unit minimum, like a minimum number of units developed that we would accept an impact fee for? Like if it's not more than ten, or maybe not more than four, then we don't take in, we don't we don't force them to, to do with the hoops or whatever we. But whatever the thing is that we do in here, whatever the ten. thing is. <laughs> but even like if it were 10 and you had four people that live in that one, I mean, you could be up to 40 people. So 40 like, people what I'm sorry, what within now? that unit. I mean, if there's more than one person that lives in the unit. Oh, no, right. And I'm so, saying, I'm saying, is there, have we explored like is, you know, a minimum number? And I don't know what the number would be. I'm not a developer, but a minimum number that. that there was. There was some thought put into that, and it's, it seemed like the across-the-board way was just to include residential development, period. Um, and that's what we're trying to, to get at there. So what's the fee for one multi one multifamily unit? Um, we just updated those. I've got it right here. I think it's like 680 $680. Uh, so, oh, I'm sorry. That's what it used to be. It's 560 Five sixty and one single family. Nine twenty. Uh, I feel like they're pretty reasonable. And we'll be looking at those fees again. We're going to look at them every year, every two years to council. But every year, yeah. so this is the year first to look at it. 
but you know, and, and I and I appreciate what you said, Richie, because we do want to encourage those types of developments. But I think it, it puts a little bit more on parks and recreation that when we're going to use that money to make certain we can make the biggest impact for those people that have, are in those developments. So include them in our process somehow, you know, on helping us determine how to u utilize that money. So. This will have to go, any proposal will have to go to Planning Commission and then City Council, so it will go through a public process. It will be advertised in the paper like any other um, ordinance amendment that would go through that way. Okay, any other discussion? Feedback, are you guys asking for us to uh, approve this this evening? Yes. Okay, and a recommendation from staff is? To approve it. To approve it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then this will go on to City Council, correct? Planning, Planning Commission first. Planning Commission, sorry. Yeah. Uh, okay. Make a motion to approve. And I second. We have a motion and a second to approve um, the revision to or the change to the parkland ordinance amendment. Um, let's go into a roll call, Melanie, if you would please. We normally don't do that, but we can. I've got two years. Leonard. Aye. Lamb. Aye. Paul. Aye. Elder. No. Lawson. Aye. Okay, passes. Onward. Uh, any? Let's see. Do we have other business? Connie, you wanted me to talk about the uh, what? What is the name of the structure? The dogwood. Bench. Okay. So last year uh, we had approved uh, the construction of a bench called the dogwood bench down in Wilson Park, right next to the castle. And so Connie's provided us with a picture of uh, how that's coming out. I don't know if you can see it, but. Um, it is coming out very nicely. If you guys get an opportunity, stop by there and see it. Looks like they've got about 90% of it done. So um, that's definitely taking shape. And that was, tell me again, who, uh, that was Eugene Sargent that's doing Eugene that for Sargent us? Eugene Sargent is the artist. Okay. So he, we've got a couple other things there that he's done. The, the sidewalk bench. worm and the... And three other benches there. Yeah. Concrete benches are all his. Very Super. spatial. Yeah. So stop by and check that out. Um, upcoming events, do you have anything else, Connie, before I go through this? The only thing is um, Parks Board, we have, of course, every three years, uh, you have to reapply to be on Parks Board. So we have three people this year. Um, I think it's Jonathan, well, Jonathan, Terry, and Steve, that their terms are up. So you need to, if you're interested, to reapply. And it's due November the 22nd. At 5 p.m. And, and don't miss the too. deadline because we had some people miss the deadline last year and they wound up not on the, That's right. on the board. So. And you, you need I'm to. I'm talking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> you better not miss the deadline. <laughs> okay. Anything else, Connie? Aubrey, what do you have there, sir? Oh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate you guys sharing the word about the Veterans Memorial 5K this weekend. I know so park people and some planning people run every year, just a few. And, uh, what are the stats on that? What, what's the date and time and place? Okay, it's uh, Saturday coming up, the 9th. 9th? Sorry. Uh, 8 a.m. on Government Avenue in front of the main entry to the Federal National Cemetery. It's to raise money to <clears throat> buy more property to expand. And it's even the the new lots purchased on Hill Avenue are filling up fast. So, boy, we're wishing uh, they had built apartments on the same of the property still, because that, that wiped out where the natural growth would have been. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but anyway, it's, we're persevering to try to do this, and uh, it's only a $25 entry fee, but it's uh, they've got so many door prizes people that play for this, you might come out ahead. Even if you don't place, I'd have to get the little dog tag with your the place you came in and the other things that go with it. A t-shirt comes with it, 
one of those wick outs. And, you know, it's it's a it, it pays the runners to come almost. Awesome. And, well, the, thank you. and the parade starts at what time? The Veterans the Parade? The Veterans Parade at is Mon Sunday. Mo no, Monday. Monday. And it's at 10. I think it, is it 10? I'm asking. Or 2. Sorry, I've got it on my internet yeah. sites and uh, others do too. The city will have it on there, I think, too. All right. But, uh, and there's one other thing uh, if you're a veteran, pay attention on Monday. Some places will give a free lunch or supper or something. Mm -hmm. Super, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it, Aubrey. Okay, uh, we'll see. November 11th next week, I believe that's Monday, Veterans Day, city offices will be closed. 12th spring soccer registration starts already, okay? Uh, 23rd, Lights of the Ozarks uh, on the downtown square. 26th, Thanksgiving bingo at the uh, Yvonne Richardson Center. The 28th and 29th, city offices will be closed observing Thanksgiving. And anybody have anything else? and then I would motion we adjourn. Thank you.